so great to see everyone this morning. I tell you, it's not fair. It's hard to concentrate smelling that good food coming into the auditorium. So uh, this morning we're going to be talking about the parable of the sower. The parable of the sower. So if you have your Bibles, if you will be turning to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. And over the next few weeks we're going to be looking at some of the parables of Jesus, some of the things that Jesus taught us in parables. Now the parable of the sower is found in Matthew chapter 13, Mark chapter 4, and Luke chapter 8. So it is important for us to take a look at this and understand what He's trying to tell us, to understand what He's trying to teach us. We sing a song sometimes, bringing in the sheaves. Or we also sing a song, we are sowers. Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the morning bright and fair? Are you sowing the seed of the kingdom, brother, in the heat of the noonday's glare? For the harvest time is coming on and the reaper's work will soon be done. Will your sheaves be many? Will your garner any for the gathering at the harvest home? There is going to be a great day of harvest in the end, isn't it? It's going to be a great day where He's going to gather up all the people that are His and bring them to heaven with Him. So if you would, let's look in Matthew chapter 13. Jesus is going to be speaking to to a large audience. It says in verse 1, The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and the great multitude were gathered together unto Him, so that He went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So there's a multitude following Jesus, so He goes out into a boat, and He's going to begin speaking unto them, and He's going to start with this parable. And He spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. What would that look like, a sower going forth to sow in this time? That looks a little different today. We have all these big machines and all these things that can do it all for us, but he would have had a sling around his neck and a bag attached to it, and he would have been taking that seed and casting that seed out to the left and casting that seed out to the right, and it would land where it would. So you have a sower going forth, and he is spreading seed. And he sowed in verse 4, he sowed some, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some seed fell on the stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of the earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no root, and they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up, and they choked them. And others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. He that has an ear, let him hear. In Luke 8 and verse 11, he's going to tell us that the seed he's talking about here is the Word of God. And the different souls are the hearts of men. Now everyone in this auditorium that is of the age of accountability has one of these hearts. Each one of us has it. But which heart do we have? That's the important thing. That's the thing for us to search and find out this morning is for us to examine the Word of God and examine ourselves next to the Word of God and find out what kind of heart we have. And if we have the wrong kind of heart, this morning is the perfect opportunity to change that, isn't it? This morning is the perfect opportunity to go from a wrong kind of heart to a right kind of heart. We are all sowers. We have all been charged with this, have we not? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now who is He talking to? When He said, go ye, what does He mean? Go me, right? So when He commands all of us to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, He was speaking to us too, wasn't He? That's Matthew 28, 19, and 20. So He's commanding us to go and to teach and to spread the Word of God to all the world. Now if you've ever planted a garden or if you've ever worked in a field, you know that fields do not plant themselves. You will not find a large field just you know, spring itself up out of the ground. There takes some work with that, doesn't it? It takes some action. It takes some moving to get that kind of thing to happen. And if you drive by a field and you see a large corn field out there, whatever kind of field it is, you know there's someone that takes care of that field, isn't it? But if they don't take care of that field, that field will become destroyed. There will either animals come in and the animals will take over that field. The weeds will spring up and they will choke out that field. There may be a flood. There may be a drought. Someone has to take care of that field. So here we have the soils that are the hearts of men. We have the seed that we're going to be planting, which is the Word of God. And we're going to be planting it into their hearts. 
So in starting in uh, Matthew 13, and verse 19, He's going to explain the parable. He's going to tell us what He's talking about. Starting in verse 18, He says, Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. Now here it is. He's going to tell us what it means. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart, these which receive the seed by the wayside. What is the wayside? Well, the wayside is a hard soil. The wayside is a soil that's been packed down and pressed down, and it is hard and cannot be easily planted. You ever driven on a dirt road? A dirt road that's been traveled quite a bit. That road is packed down and that road is hard, is it not? That road has been pressed down and if you were to throw seed on that, how many plants do you think would spring forth? Not very many because that seed won't penetrate the ground. The ground is too hard. The birds will come and they will snatch it away and this is the same as the heart that is found on the wayside. It is a heart that is hardened to the point they will not receive the Word of God and the Word of God is straightway snatched away by Satan. A perfect example of this is Pharaoh in Exodus 8 and verse 32. In Exodus 8 and verse 32, it says, And Pharaoh hardened his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. He had already made up in his mind, I'm not going to do what Moses says. When Moses preached, he made up his mind, I'm not going to do that. I don't believe in the God of heaven. I believe in the God of the Egyptians. He trusted in himself. He trusted in the false idols. So he says he has hardened his heart to a point where he will not obey the gospel. You ever met someone like that? They can read right here what the Gospel says and they can say, I don't care, I can read it in plain black and white letters, but I'm not going to do it. You ever met someone like that? This is the heart that is hardened. This is the heart that is the wayside soil. It is the heart that has been packed down and pressed down and refuses the Word of God. The Pharisees hardened their heart to the Word of God. We've talked about them quite a bit lately, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with them, but they had a heart that says, I've seen the miracles of Jesus, I've seen the things that He's done, I've heard the words that He said, but I'm not going to obey them. This is the heart of the Pharisee. It is a hardened heart. We must be careful that we do not become like the Pharisees in some of their aspects. One of the things that they did was they would look upon the appearance of a man. We talked about that a little bit Wednesday night. Looking upon the appearance of someone. It's not how they look. It's not how they dress. It's not what they say. It's not how they act. One of the most quoted verses in the entire world. Someone that's never picked up a Bible, never read a page of it, can tell you, judge not that you be not judged. They know that verse by memory. But what's he talking about? What's he saying in that verse? Well, the verse that goes along with that is John 7 and verse 24. In John 7 and verse 24, he says, Judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Now, we all believe that we, we, we can make judgments, don't we? Is there a profession in this country known as a judge? We have to make judgments. If someone commits murder, is there not a judgment cast upon them for their actions? Absolutely. So it's not wrong to have judgment, but it is wrong to judge upon the outward appearance. To say, I can look at that person and see how that person dresses, and I know that that person will not accept the gospel. That's wrong. We can't look upon the heart of a man, can we? We can't see that. We can't see what's going on inside. But he says, do not judge by what you see on the outside. Someone might have looked at us and said, well, that person's not going to listen. That person's not going to obey, so I'm not going to waste my time. And then where would we be? We would be lost, wouldn't we? Because no one took the time to tell us. So let's not look upon the outward appearance as the Pharisees did and harden our hearts and say that person is not willing to obey. Many in the world today and some even in the church today have hardened their hearts and have decided to refuse to accept God's authority in matters concerning the doctrine of Jesus Christ. They have strayed. They have gone aside to strange worship and strange practices and strange ways of salvation. It reminds me of the days of 1 Samuel. If you look in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verses 6 and 7, the people cried out. 1 Samuel chapter 8 verses 6 and 7, and it said, But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people, and all that they say unto thee, for they have not rejected thee, but they rejected me. So many in the world want to be like the world, or so many some in the church want to be like the world round about us, don't they? Give us a king that we may be like those round about us. 
when it comes to instrumental music and when it comes to salvation and when it comes to so many important things, so many important teachings of the church, they say we want to be like the nations round about us. We want to be similar. We don't like being different, do we? Do you like being different? Do you like walking into a crowd and being different from everyone else into that crowd? Do you feel a little uncomfortable? We've got to be different though, don't we? We're a peculiar people, aren't we? We're different from the world. But see, they were saying, give us a king. And when, he, when they said that, he's saying, they're not rejecting you. They're not rejecting what you're saying. They're rejecting me. They don't want me to be their king. This is the hard ground. This is the ground that's been pressed down that rejects the Word of God because they've already made up their mind they're not going to obey. Then we have another soil. Verse 20. But he that receiveth the seed into the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy receive it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but endureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the world, and by and by he is offended, he stumbleth. This is the person that is on the rocky ground. He is shallow in his beliefs. He has not taken root. He has not grounded himself. His heart has not matured in God. It isn't given time. One of the most difficult times for a Christian is when they come up out of that water. You may be asking, why is that one of the most difficult times? Because you've made a decision that you're going to obey God. And when you come up out of that water, everything that you were before that is now gone from your life. But you still have family. You still have friends. You still have ties into that world that's trying to drag you back into that world, don't you? And if we don't ground ourselves and we don't root ourselves and we don't meditate and study the Word of God, we can quickly and easily be drawn right back into that. This heart right here is the new convert with friends and family trying to drag them back into the world. This heart needs constant watching. This heart needs constant care and and teaching and love and maturity. This heart will run in times of persecution. This heart will be easily offended. This heart will quit when things get hard. This is a heart that needs to grow. This is a heart that needs roots. This is a heart that was once saved and is now lost. Many in the world teach us that we cannot be lost once we've been saved. But he says these people here, they knew it. They had it. They received it. They heard it. But when it got difficult, they walked away. This is a heart that needs to grow. In 2 Peter 2 and verses 19 and following, he tells us what happens to this kind of heart. In verse 19, he's talking about those that are teaching. It says, While they promise them liberty, they themselves are servants of corruption. For whom, or for of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. Notice it now. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have ever known the way of righteousness. Not to have ever ever obeyed God. It would have been better not to have ever known than to have known it and walk away. He said that is more more wicked. That That is worse for them. But it has happened to them according to the true proverb. The dog has turned to its own vomit again. And the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. You can picture this clean animal. If you have a dog or a cat... Well, more more likely a dog. If you have a dog and you've just given your dog a bath, it's clean, it's it's washed, and you're thinking, this is, look at it, it's a beautiful dog. And you let that dog outside and it's been raining and the first thing it does is runs and it dives in the mud and the water. That animal that was once clean is now back again dirty. What he's saying here is the soul that was once clean, the soul that was once washed, the soul that was once made pure, has gone back into the world and dirtied itself up in sin. This is the one that is on the rocky ground. Verse 22, He also that receiveth the seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. This man loves the world. 
This man sees so many things in life and there's so many desires that he has that he can't make up his mind which one he wants. He wants to grow, but at the same time, he can't let go of what he wants outside of the church. This is a heart that will choose not to be here on Wednesday night. This is the heart that will choose not to be here on Sunday nights. This is the heart that will skip because there are higher things on the priority list. This is the heart where television becomes more important than studying the Bible with his neighbor. This is the heart that seeks God after seeking the world first. Even though Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and then all of these things shall be added unto you. This is the heart that seeks God second. This man becomes unfruitful. Why would this person become unfruitful? How is it possible that this person will become unfruitful? Because he's double-minded, isn't he? He's trying to have one foot over here and one foot over here and he's trying to hold on to both of them and they're both pulling him in opposite directions and he don't know which way to go because he loves them both. Jesus said no man can serve two masters. Why? Because eventually he's going to hate one and love the other. When this side says you can't do this and this side says you can't do that and he's stuck in the middle, he's going to have to make a choice. He's going to have to make a decision. We all have to make a decision. What comes first in our life? God or the world. No man can serve two masters. Why does he become unfruitful? Because the world sees that. Can the world see hypocrisy? The world sees. The world sees when we say one thing and do another. And if the world sees us saying one thing and doing another, will they want to be part of what we're doing? No. Because they know we don't believe it. Isn't that true whenever you're doing something? If you live one way and you speak another, you really don't believe what you're saying. This is the heart that is on thorny ground. It is the heart that has decided it's going to try and serve two masters. There is something that is important enough to keep them from assembling together with the saints. There's something that is important enough to hold them back from serving God faithfully. This is the heart that is on the thorny ground. But then there's another heart. Verse 23. But he that receiveth the seed in the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also bears fruit, and bringeth forth fruit, some an hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. This is the heart that is good. This is the heart that hears. This is the heart that understands and this is the heart that bears fruit because they love God. This is the heart that will obey even when times are difficult. This is the heart that will go through the trials and the tribulations. In Luke 8 and verse 15 he says, But that on the good ground are they which have an honest and a good heart, having heard the word, they keep it and they bring forth fruit with patience. We're going to have to be patient. Now I'm not very good at being patient sometimes. How about you? Sometimes uh, you hear people talking and, and they're joking, of course, but they say, you know, people talk about praying for patience and they want it now. They want to have that prayer answered right now because they don't have the patience to wait. Sometimes when we're studying with someone, it may be one study and that person is converted. Other times, it may take 10, 15, 20 years before that person is converted. But we're going to have to stay steady and we're going to have to be patient and work with that person and teach them. These people have honest hearts. These people have good hearts because they keep the Word of God that they have received. Keeping the Word of God. That's an important thing, isn't it? When we learn it, to follow it, and obey it. They will be here every time the doors are open, if they can be. These are the people that will volunteer. These are the people that will volunteer to teach or lead singing or do the things that they can do to help out. These will be those who will step up and do the work that God has called us to do. These will be those who volunteer. This is the good ground. This is the good soil. This is the soil that says no matter what comes my way, I am going to serve God. Luke in his account, he's writing to a man named Theophilus. Oh, Theophilus. And he's telling him some of the things that are going to come to pass. In Luke 1 and verse 3, you can see where he's talking to Theophilus. And in Luke 24, he's going to talk about repentance and remission of sins being taught in His name, talking about Christ. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. 
So he's talking about repentance and remission of sins being taught in Jerusalem. When we get to Acts chapter 2, we find the apostles in Jerusalem and they're preaching. And when they preach, they're telling the people that they need to repent and be baptized. For what reason? Remission of sins. Luke is giving him a heads up. He's telling him repentance and remission of sins are going to be taught. When we get to Acts chapter 2, Peter says, Repent and be baptized. Why? For the remission of sins. Now when they heard this, they had two options. They could have rejected it, or they could have accepted it, couldn't they? They had two options. We, are all, we all have free will, don't we? We all have the, the right to make that decision. I'm going to either not obey God, or I am going to obey God. But these people here had good hearts. In Acts 2 and verse 42, it said that they received the word with gladness. And then they did what? They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. These are good hearts. These are hearts that says, I'm going to obey God. These are hearts that says, I'm going to follow God. I'm not going to deviate to the left. I'm not going to deviate to the right. The question that I have this morning is, what kind of heart do you have? Where is your heart this morning? Is the seed growing in your heart? Is the Word of God growing? Has it taken root? What kind of sowers are we this morning? Do we sow sparingly? Do we sow rarely? Do we sow not at all? Or do we sow bountifully? In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6, he says, But I say this, He which soweth sparingly shall also reap sparingly, but he which soweth bountifully shall also reap bountifully. There's a whole world out there that needs the Word, isn't it? The population is in the billions. How many of them are New Testament Christians? The world needs the Word of God. Columbus, Mississippi, I don't know what the population is. But I would take a guess that there are a lot more non-Christians than Christians, wouldn't you? How many souls need to be saved right here in this town? This is important. This is a chief command that we have to go and to teach. What kind of sowers are we? Our friends, our neighbors, our brothers, our sisters, our co workers, our classmates, all of those around us that we see on a daily basis. We need to sow that seed, don't we? They need to hear the Word of God. Because if they don't hear the Word of God, then they won't have a chance to obey it. And if they do not obey the Gospel, where will their eternity be? I ask that you look at your heart this morning and find out what kind of soil are you. And I will look at my heart and find out what kind of soil am I. And if you need to make a correction, perhaps your heart is that hard soil. The kind of soil that's difficult to penetrate because that soil has decided that it is going to reject God. Or perhaps your heart is on stony ground, needs to take root, needs to dig deeper into God's Word so that it can be grounded and become immovable. Or perhaps, just perhaps, you're on that thorny ground right now and you're trying to decide, am I going to be faithful to the world? Or am I going to be faithful to my Father? And that's a decision we have to make. And it comes down to so many aspects of our lives. Or do you have a good heart who's willing to repent? A good heart that's willing to obey. A good heart that's willing to love and follow God. If you have not become a New Testament Christian, then we invite you to obey the Gospel. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, are you willing to repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins so that your heart can go from whichever foundation that you find it right now into good soil? Or perhaps you're a member of the New Testament church and you found that your heart has gone from the good soil to the thorny soil. Or perhaps from the good soil to the rocky soil. And you need to make it right. Then do not delay. Come now while we stand and while we sing.